All right, everybody, welcome back to another session of CE397, Control Theory for Smart Infrastructure. Uh, we've got a really exciting lesson for you today. Uh, this is going to be one of the uh, most memorable lessons, I think, in the class, because this week we are going to get started on controls, the namesake of the class. Uh, and I believe that this will be something that is new to all of you here. Let's just recap quickly what we covered last time. So last week we started to kind of transition into new material that you may not have seen in your undergraduate curriculum. We looked at poles in the complex plane and specifically we looked at the influence of poles on the stability of an LTI system. So who remembers what conditions are required in terms of the poles for a system to be stable, for a continuous time system to be stable? Can anyone tell me? What do the pull, what, uh, where do the poles need to lie for a continuous time system to be stable? Right, the real part of the pole must be negative. Uh, and what about for discrete time systems? Where do the poles need to lie? Inside of the unit circle. So very good. So that is the summary of the lesson from last time. Uh, you can determine the stability properties of a system simply by looking at where the poles lie in the complex plane. So we talked about poles in the complex plane. We also talked about the zeros of an LTI system and how they affect the response. So whereas the poles kind of uh, characterize the system itself, the zeros characterize uh, how the input is applied to the system. And in particular, the zeros affect the gain associated with each pole. Uh, and we talked about how, uh, while it's difficult to know exactly what effect zeros are going to have, they generally tend to attenuate uh, the effect of a pole if they are located uh, near a pole. Okay, so you'll get a chance within the next couple lectures to think about zeros a bit too. Okay, are there any questions on these two concepts before I move on? Nope, okay. And then at the very end of class last time, we talked about block diagrams and how we could use them to represent um, perhaps more, more complex or sophisticated types of systems. So we talked about block diagram algebra. Uh, we looked at blocks in series. So this would represent, you know, for instance, different transfer functions in series. Um, and we found that if you have transfer functions in series, the combined effect is to simply multiply those two transfer functions together. If you have transfer functions in parallel, uh, the ultimate effect is to add those transfer functions together. And we also gave an example where we could represent uh, represent systems with multiple components. So who remembers what example I gave here? Yeah, so we had a structural system with a sensor on it. We had a structural system with a sensor on it. And we showed that we could represent the uh, observed output of the sensor using a combined transfer function, right? So we had a transfer function for the dynamics of the system itself. And we had a transfer function uh, for the accelerometer that allowed us to represent uh, what the sensor output should be in terms of the dynamics of the system. Okay, there's one important concept that I didn't touch on, but that's going to be extremely important for our lecture today. And that is the concept of feedback and block diagrams. So I want to quickly uh, show what effect feedback, feedback has uh, when we look at it in terms of a block diagram. Let's take a look at a block diagram with a feedback loop. Okay, so let's say we have uh, some input U of S. Okay, so we're in the frequency domain. Okay, that input is going to go into a transfer function H1 of S. And the output of 
that transfer function, we will call y of s our output. Okay, but we're going to add an additional component to our block diagram here. Our output y of s, we're going to take it and we're going to feed it back into another transfer function, which I'll call h2 of s. And the output of H2 of S, we're going to feed back into this junction point here. Okay. In particular, we are going to, at this junction, we're going to add U of S and subtract the output of H2 of S. Okay, so in summary, uh, we have a input to the system, some exogenous input U of S. Uh, that input is being fed into a transfer function H1 of S, which produces an output Y of S. And then we're going to feed that output Y of S back into another transfer function H2 of S uh, that's going to be fed back into our first transfer function H1 of S. Okay, so this is an example of a feedback system. Okay, so let's let's see what happens when we try to come up with an expression for Y of S. Okay, so to create an expression for y of s, we can simply just follow the different paths on this block diagram. So the output y of s is equal to our transfer function h1 of s times whatever is on this branch here, right? Mm -hmm. So y of s is equal to our transfer function h1 of s multiplied by this input here. So what is what is on this branch here? What is this input? We can express y of s is equal to h1 of s times what? What's the quantity on this branch here? Exactly. So it's u of s minus h2 of s times y of s. Okay, so we've got an equation with y of s on both sides. Uh, so let's go ahead and see if we can simplify this so we can isolate y of s. Okay, if we expand this out, we get y of s is equal to h1 of s u of s minus h1 of s h2 of s y of s. Okay, let's bring the terms with y of s all over to one side. So we have y of s plus h1 of s, h2 of s, y of s is equal to h1 of s, u of s. Okay, so I've just moved the terms with y of s over to the same side. And now we can factor out this y of s. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Give you a couple seconds here. Okay, we're going to go ahead and factor out y of s. We have y of s times quantity one plus h one of s, h two of s is equal to h one of s u of s. Okay, now what we can do is let's just isolate y of s over on its own side. So we have y of s is equal to the following rational function, h1 of s divided by one plus h1 of s, h2 of s, all times u of s. Okay, so does this formulation look familiar? We have that our output y of s is equal to something times our input u of s. So what does that make this here? Sorry? Yeah, so it's, a, it's another transfer function, right? We can, we can take our feedback loop and represent it as what's called a closed loop transfer function. OK, 
Okay, it's the function that translates us from the input to the output. Therefore, it is the transfer function of our uh, feedback system. So we can rewrite this as you know, a new block diagram with u of s times some new block transfer function h bar of s results in output y of s, where h bar of s for this particular block diagram, note that it won't always be exactly the same, will be equal to h1 of s divided by one plus h1 of s h2 of s. Okay, so what this tells us is with feedback, let's say that, let's say if we go back to our original system, H1 of S is perhaps the physical system that we're trying to analyze and control. So this may be the transfer function of um, the structural system and maybe the transfer function of the uh, heating system that you explored in homework two. Let's say we have that system and we like to control it. And we have another transfer function that represents our control. Our, our control function or our control law. What that means is that with feedback, we can create a new system that will behave however we want. Specifically, we have a new transfer function and we can design H2 of S to place the poles of the system wherever we want and thus create a system that behaves exactly how we want it to. Okay, so with feedback, we have the power to essentially create a new system with the desired properties that we want. Okay. Are there any questions on this process? What right. was the point made minus the C because of all it comes in the old way? So in this in this case, um, you know, you could design a feedback system that has positive on both sides. And also it depends what the sign of this transfer function is too. Um, ultimately, the important thing is that you design your closed loop transfer function to have the properties that you want. Um, and generally, you will have a, a minus on the feedback loop to get the behavior that you want, assuming a positive gain uh, or assuming a positive control function. Yeah. But ultimately, the important part is that you design this closed loop transfer function to have the properties you want. Okay, good question. Are there any other conceptual questions on feedback before I move on? No? So let's give a quick uh, motivating example of why we might wanna use feedback. Okay, let's in particular look at the problem of stabilization. Okay, so let's say we have a system with a transfer function, H of S is equal to one over S minus A. So a simple first order transfer function. Um, is this system stable or unstable? What's the pole of this system? A, right? So if you take the inverse Laplace transform, you will get, h of t is equal to e to the a t, right? So this is unstable, right? This will blow up as time goes to infinity. Okay, so let's say we have our block diagram of this system. We have some input u of s. Okay, that input is going into our open loop transfer function h of s. Uh, actually, I'll just write, I'll write out the transfer function explicitly here. Uh, so this is one over S minus A. Okay, that produces an output Y of S, which we are gonna take, and we're gonna feed it back into another transfer function. And this transfer function is just going to be a constant K. Okay, so it's a really simple transfer function, but we're going to see what happens. 
Okay, so we're taking our output from this open loop transfer function. We're feeding it back through this transfer function k, which is just a, a scalar constant. And we're going to subtract it at this point here. And we're going to add our input u of s here. So let's go back and take a look at what the closed loop transfer function looks like. We have h bar of s is equal to h of s over 1 plus h1 of s, h2 of s. So let's write this out. We have h of s divided by 1 plus h of s times k, right? That's from the expression we developed in the previous slide. I've substituted in h of s for h1 of s and k for h2 of s, given that our second transfer function is just a, a constant k. Okay, so let's go ahead and substitute this in. We get h of s is equal to one over s minus a. On the bottom, we have one plus k over s minus a. Okay, so what can we do to simplify this a little bit more? Yeah, so let's give it a common denominator in this denominator here. So we'll have one over S minus A divided by S minus A plus K over S minus A, right? So I've just taken this one here and I multiplied it by S minus A over S minus A. Okay, so you can see that these two denominators will divide out. I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next slide, but I'll give you a second to write this down. Okay, so we have that our closed loop transfer function h bar of s, if we take this expression here, we divide out these s minus a's, we get one over s minus a plus k. Okay, and we can rewrite this as one over s plus k minus a. Okay, so now we have a new transfer function representing our controlled system, our system with feedback control. When will this system be stable? First of all, is it possible for this system to be stable? Yes. When will this system be stable? Exactly. So I'll write stable if k is greater than a. Okay, so we can essentially stabilize the system by specifying a adequate control gain, right? To place the pole of the system such that it's no longer in the right-hand plane, such that um, our pole no longer has a positive real part. Okay, and that is, uh, something that we will be applying later today uh, for a real world system that we want to stabilize. But the basic idea is that in feedback control, we can use feedback to create a new system with the properties that we want. In this case, we took an unstable system and we made it stable. All right. Are there any questions before I move on? Any questions? How are y'all feeling? Pretty good? All right. Anyone got any midterms coming up or anything like that? No? <laughs> All right. All right, cool. So with that, I'll move on to the main topic of today's lecture, which is Control, okay, so this is our first taste of control in this course. Um, we're going to do a little bit of control this week. We're going to take a, a detour into um, multivariable systems. And then towards the end of the course, we'll come back later to control. Um, but what I want to do today is kind of introduce you to control 
what it's all about, what we're trying to do with control. And in particular, I'm going to introduce you to a very commonly used technique for control called PID control, which stands for proportional integral derivative control. Who's heard of the term PID control before? Anybody heard the, heard the term PID control? So this is a very commonly used method for control. It works for a lot of real world systems. You'll find it all over the place in uh, electrical engineering, industrial process control, that sort of thing. It just tends to work very well. Drones, uh, drones will use PID control to control their motion, robots. Um, extremely commonly used technique. I'm going to kind of go through what PID control is, how it works, and how you can apply it to a uh, real world system. Okay. So with that, I would first want to give you a high level overview of control and how it applies to civil systems. So today we're going to be talking about control of single variable systems. Okay. Um, so I wanna give a high level overview of control, what the different types of control are and how they apply to civil engineering systems in particular. So, in this class, we are primarily concerned with active control, which I will define in a second. Okay, so we're concerned with active control of systems, which means that we are uh, using some sort of actuator or some sort of input in, into the system, some sort of dynamical input to control its behavior. So in general with control, there are several different types. So if we're looking at control, we have two basic types. The first is passive and the second is active. So passive control is, uh, essentially what civil engineers do by default. So this is what we're this is what we're typically trained to do as civil engineers, right? We design a civil infrastructure system uh, in some way as to control its behavior or make it behave in the way that we want. So what are some examples of passive control? I'll give you I'll give you a couple examples to start off with here. So what are some examples of passive control? in civil engineering. Let me just give you a couple examples to start with and then um, I can solicit some responses from you as well. Uh, so one type of passive control for those of you working in the water resources space would be something like a detention pond. Okay, so we might have a detention pond uh, with some sort of outlet structure Okay. And our detention pond might have some inflow of water. Okay. And we design the outlet structure of the detention pond. We design the area, the surface area of the detention pond in order to um, make the outflow of the detention pond have the characteristics that we want. So for instance, we want to slow down the flow. We want to limit the flow to under a, a certain magnitude. So a, a detention pond would be an example of passive control. Um, just looking at some of the examples we've looked at in class before, another example of passive control might be the building heating system that we looked at in homework two. So let's say we have a building heating system. We know that the heat coming out of the room uh, is the heat that is conducted through the walls of the building. We might try to control this heat loss by adding insulation to the walls, right? So this would be an example of passive control. We're trying to control the heat loss through some static design. So I'll just write uh, insulation. Okay, and maybe on the structural side, uh, who's heard of a tuned mass damper? Has anyone heard of a tuned mass damper? So you might've seen pictures of this at some point in your life. Um, I'll draw it out over here. So we might have a structure. And there's a very famous one 
uh, that often you'll see pictures of it um, just in popular culture. Uh, the, the Taipei 101 building in, in Taiwan um, has a tuned mass damper and it's essentially a, a mass, a large mass on the inside of the structure that is supported by um, damped springs. Um, and it's used to control the oscillations of the building during earthquakes or wind loadings. So you can have this tuned mass damper in the structure that prevents the amplitude of the oscillations from becoming too large. So I'll call it a tuned mass damper. Okay. And it's used to control the dynamic response of a structure, especially during earthquakes uh, or wind loadings. Are there any other examples of passive control you can think of just in, in your experience as civil engineers? Weirs, yep, weirs. So it's another kind of similar control structure to a detention pond, a weirs. What other types of passive control structures have you encountered? Anything uh, on the building energy or electrical side? No. Is it like kind of like an op-ed? If I have the feedback of the resistor, would that be, or was that an active op-ed? That's a good question. Um, I think they would they would both essentially be analyzed the same way. Um, I'm actually not sure what that would be categorized as because they will uh, mathematically they will be kind of the same. Um, but I think I think we kind of understand the general idea is that, that passive control, we're designing some passive element of the system um, to get the behavior of the system that we want. Right? This is typically what civil engineers do. Uh, what we're going to be concerned with in this class is active control. Okay. So active control is different from passive control in that we are you know, generally using some sort of real-time actuation to get the behavior that we want out of the system. So perhaps the most down-to-earth example I can think of would be the building heating system. So let's look at the building heating system that we looked at in homework two. We have a room. We have that the heat escaping from the room is given by uh, phi of C, which I believe was equal to one over R times Ti minus Ta where Ti is the temperature inside the room, Ta is the ambient temperature outside. And in the problem in homework two, we also had a heater in the middle of the room that could output some heat flux phi of H. Okay, so what aspect of the system can we control? Why is this active control, first of all? Yeah, the heater. So we can actually uh, determine a control schedule for the heater to output the heat into the room over time to get the temperature characteristics in the room that we want. Okay, so this would be kind of a like a very common example of active control, like uh, any building with a thermostat um, or any building where you can actively control the temperature is an example of active control. Uh, in civil engineering. Okay, so phi of H, this is our control input. Okay. And we can write the actual dynamical equation for this system. Uh, I believe it was something like C di, uh, dti by dt is equal to phi of H minus one over R times ti minus ta, right? Okay, and we can rewrite this uh, in the form of our LTI system, standard LTI system, DTI by DT, 
plus one over RC TIT is equal to one over C times phi of H plus one over RC TA of T. Uh, let me just add T to here by H of T. Okay, so note that in this system, we have the internal dynamics of the system expressed over on the left-hand side here, but we actually have two different inputs. And this is an important distinction to make here. So this, this heating load, we know that this is our control input. So this is the part of the system that we actually have control over that we are controlling. This part of the system here is determined by the ambient temperature outside, which we don't have any control over. So they are both inputs to the system, but the heater input is the control input. The ambient temperature, we can call the disturbance input. Okay, so they both get added together. The control input and the disturbance input get added together, but it's just important to distinguish when you're doing control problems that there are exogenous inputs to the system that you can control. And then there are those that you cannot control, which are the disturbance inputs. Both of them will drive the behavior of the system, but it's an important distinction to make. Okay, are there any questions on this example? Before I move on. So this will be a, an example that will appear in homework four. So I just wanted to make you aware of that distinction. Okay. Let's look at another example. Just going with our examples that we showed for the case of passive control, we can have a structural system with active control as well. Okay. So let's say we have our old friend, the structural system. Um, it's a structural system, mass, damping, stiffness, and there is some disturbance load, which I'll call FD of T. So this might be something like an earthquake. Okay, but we can actually install an actuator on the building itself. It might look something like this. And this actuator can provide a countervailing force, which I will call FC of T. Okay, so this is an actuator. And they actually do this uh, in some structures where they will have a actuator inside the structure that can um, actively kind of control the displacement of the structure during disturbances. So this is a real thing that is done in some cases. Um, and we have the dynamics of this system. We have our um, spring mass damper dynamics, mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx is equal to fd of t plus fc of t. Okay, so, uh, so again, both inputs get added together, but one of them is a control action and the other is the disturbance action. Okay. Are there any questions on this example? Okay, one final example I want to give is one that's a little bit more complicated, but something that I think is relevant to many of you here. So let's talk about uh, the control of a reservoir. Okay, let's go back to the tank problem from homework two. Let's say we have some tank Okay. And there's a inflow and some outlet. Okay, so there is water coming in. Okay, and the water level is here. We have some inflow Q in, and we have some outflow Q out. Okay. Um, so for a system like this, what would we typically 
treat as the disturbance, let's say it's a detention pond, what would we treat as the disturbance and what would we treat as the control? Let's say we have a, a detention pond that we would like to uh, use for flood control, for instance. What would this disturbance be and what would the control signal be? Sorry? Sorry. Yeah, so um, let, let me write out the dynamical equation for this system really quick. So we have from the tank problem, we have A dH by dT is equal to Q in minus Q out. Right. Uh, for, so, sorry. So the height will be controlled. What what will our control input be, though? Q out. So that would be the natural aspect of the system that we're trying to control. Okay. So, um, so this will be our control input, I will call it, um, and Q in, let's say we have a flood wave coming into the system, this will be our, um, our disturbance input. Okay, we don't necessarily have any control of what's coming into the system here. Okay, so for a system like this, we can't actually control Q out directly. What would we have access to? So let's say, um, yeah, what, what would we typically have access to to control this Q out? So first of all, let's assume that there's no kind of control structure here, uh, that the water just comes out of this outlet. We have that our dynamics are given by A D H D T is equal to Q in, and Q out is given by the orifice equation, right? So this would be something like minus C A O times square root of two G H. So we have an orifice here. What we can often do is you can do something like install a valve that you can open or close, right? So we might be able to control the position of the valve from zero all the way close to one all the way open. So what we have here is actually a constrained control problem we can write it as follows. We have something like A dH by dT is equal to Q in minus Q out, where Q out is between zero and um, the value given by our orifice equation. Let me just write this out to give myself more space. Q out zero is less than or equal to Q out is less than or equal to C A O times square root of two G H. Okay, so this is a constrained control problem. Uh, these appear very often in civil engineering because we're often dealing with systems where we have very limited actuator authority. Um, so you can formulate problems like this as control problems as well. It's just sometimes you need to account for constraints on, uh, on your control input, right? In this case, our control input is constrained within a certain range that depends on the depth of the water in the system. Okay, all this is to say that um, what I want you to, when I'm talking about control problems, I don't want you to think of these control problems as only applying to a certain subset of problems. You can really make any civil engineering system you can think of into a control problem as long as you know how to formulate its dynamics correctly, right? Or as long as you know how to formulate the control problem correctly. So I don't want you to think of controls as only being something you can apply to um, certain types of systems that we'll be looking at as examples. Really, you can think of any civil engineering problem as a control problem if it's properly formulated. Okay. Are there any, any questions on these examples before I move on? 
Cool. What are what are some examples of active control problems you can think of just off the top of your head uh, in civil engineering? What are some what are some other examples of active control? What are some other examples you can think of? Traffic signals, yep. So that is something that um, many transportation researchers do look at in the context of control. Uh, what about other, other control problems in transportation? Can you think of any other control pro active control problems in transportation? Any ideas? Did you have an idea? Speed, speed what? Speed bumps. That would probably be more of an example of passive control. But one example in uh, kind of along those lines would be adaptive cruise control. Or really anything with self-driving cars where you have to manage the distance between a tailing and leading vehicle. Um, you know, pretty much everything in a wastewater treatment plant or water treatment plant. So I'll just say water, wastewater treatment. Okay, so there's tons, tons and tons of examples of active control problems in civil engineering. Um, they are simply underexploited because many civil engineers do not learn these uh, methods, which I will be teaching you. Okay. Uh, but what I want you to think of for your project is how you can address civil engineering problems uh, through the use of controls or estimation or other techniques in this class. Okay. Great. Are there any, any questions on these examples before I move on? Okay. So we categorize two main types of control problems, passive and active. Within active, there are also um, two primary types of control. The first is open loop, and the second is closed loop or feedback control. So in essence, um, open loop control is a form of control in which the controller has no knowledge or, of the disturbance or the system um, response. So it's essentially the case where you're trying to find a control input to drive the system to some desired state, uh, but without any information uh, from the uh, system itself. Okay, so an example of an open loop control architecture in terms of a block diagram would look something like this. Uh, you'll have a input I'll call U of S, okay, that is being added to a disturbance, which I'll call D of S, okay, and those both get fed into the transfer function of the system, uh, which I will call a plant. Okay, so this is the terminology for the transfer function of the system in the domain of controls. It's often called a plant. Uh, I don't exactly know why it's called that, but you will see that terminology. Uh, in the controls field, okay, and feeding those inputs into the plant or the system produces a response uh, Y of S, which is our output. Okay, so you have, um, this is the uh, portion of the system corresponding to the input output. Um, essentially what you're doing in open loop control is you're trying to create a controller to produce the desired output. You're essentially trying to guess the control signal that will give you your desired output Y of S. Uh, and typically you are trying to track a reference R of S. So this is a reference signal. Okay. Um, so quickly, let me just label all of these. Uh, U of S, this is our control input. 
D of S is the disturbance. And Y of S is our output. Okay. Um, so this was kind of like the most naive type of control. It's very commonly used in practice, but um, it often doesn't work very well because it requires you to kind of guess what the disturbance is going to be. And also it requires you to know the dynamics of the system um, accurately in order to come up with a control signal that will produce the response you want. So often in practice, it doesn't perform very well. The type of control that we'll be looking at in this class is primarily closed loop control. Okay, and this is a form of control that utilizes feedback to uh, try to control the output of the system, get it to do what we want to do. So let me just draw the topology of a closed loop control problem here. And I won't label these yet. Okay, so we have a controller, K of S. Okay, so this is our portion of the system representing our control. Okay, it will produce some input U of S that will be added to some disturbance D of S. And that will be fed into our plant representing our system, which is H of S. Okay, and that will produce some output Y of S. Okay, that Y of S, we're going to take it and we are going to feed it back into uh, some sort of sensor or something that can observe that output. We're going to feed it back all the way to this junction here. Um, you know what? I'm going to, instead of writing this as Y of S, I'm going to write this as X of S. The output of the plant is X of S. And then the output of the sensor I'll call Y of S. Okay, so this is our observed output. And this is going to be fed back here. On this branch here, we have R of S. This is our reference signal. Okay, so this is the signal that we're trying to track. Okay, and we're going to add the reference signal and subtract our sensor output. Okay, what we get when we subtract the output from our reference signal is we get the input to the controller, which we'll call E of S. And this is the error between our reference signal and our observed output y of s. Okay, so the e of s is the error. It's equal to r of s minus y of s. This is the error between the reference and observed output. Okay. And what we're trying to do in feedback control is we're trying to design this controller to minimize the difference between that, between the reference signal and the observed output. Okay, so that's what that feedback loop is doing. Uh, you are trying to drive that error to zero uh, and therefore track the reference signal. Okay, and I'll give an example later on in class that'll show exactly how we can do this. Um, but I just want to quickly characterize for you the advantages of feedback control over open loop control. Okay. The first is disturbance rejection. So this is something that you will prove on homework four, but if you have a high enough control gain, um, essentially the effect on the system response will be to drive the effect of the disturbance to zero. Okay, so if your control gain in the system is high enough, you essentially, uh, essentially reduce the effect of the disturbance to zero. So this is called disturbance rejection. Uh, another important advantage of feedback is reference tracking. Okay, 
So as I mentioned in the previous slide, if you design your controller adequately, uh, you can get the response of the system to track a reference signal exactly uh, or nearly exactly if you make your control gain high enough. Um, so for instance, in a building thermal system that might correspond to tracking the desired temperature on the thermostat, for instance. Um, it provides a way of you know, exactly tracking the behavior that you want. Uh, and the final advantage of feedback over open loop control is a really important one. It's robust to uncertainty. And particularly, it's robust to uncertainty in the system model. Okay. And you can also show this uh, through analyzing that feedback equation. Um, essentially, when you're using feedback control, you don't have to characterize the dynamics of the system perfectly. If you use uh, feedback, you'll essentially still achieve these advantages of disturbance rejection and reject, uh, reference tracking, even if your system model is not perfect. Um, Feedback allows you allows your control strategy to be robust to uncertainty in the system model and also to uncertainty in the uh, disturbance input as well. Okay, and at least for the first two properties, uh, I believe you will be proving this in homework four. Okay, so you'll show exactly how feedback control uh, rejects disturbances and tracks a reference signal. Okay, are there any questions? Yes. Example, um, something in civil engineering using open loop control. Let's see, open loop control. I might have to get back to you on that because I'm just having trouble thinking off the top of my head. Can anyone else think of an example of open loop control in civil engineering? Well, um, an example might be a water treatment plant or something where you have to figure out the dosing of some chemical to um, you know, obtain the chemical properties that you want. Uh, and the operators may simply have to use their you know, experience to determine how much dosage of chlorine to put in, um, you know, what temperature to set the reactors to and so on. There's no information coming in from the uh, sensors directly that will automatically determine what those inputs need to be. Rather, it's the operators trying to figure out exactly, you know, how much chlorine do I need to put in? How much, you know, what do I need to set the temperature to? And so on. Um, so technically it is sort of feedback because the operators are watching the system and kind of, uh, right. But, um, yeah, so that would be an example of open loop control. It's essentially trying to find the input signal that will produce the desired response um, without having a direct feedback from the output of the system. Okay, good question. All right, so are there any other questions conceptually? So in this lecture and what remains, we will be looking at what's called PID control. Okay. This is an example of um, feedback control. So this is active closed loop control. As I mentioned before, it's one of the most uh, venerable control techniques is used all over the place, um, particularly in mechanical aerospace and electrical engineering. Um, and let's take a look at an example system that'll help illustrate the utility of PID control. And the system we'll be looking at is the Segway scooter. So who's familiar with uh, the Segway scooter? Who knows what a Segway scooter is? A couple of you, who doesn't know what a Segway scooter is? Who, do, who, do, uh, who doesn't know what a Segway scooter is? 
Anybody? It's okay. Um, and, and the previous time I taught this class, nobody knew what a Segway scooter was. I was very surprised. Um, but you've probably seen these. Um, you know, you might see people doing campus tours on these things. So it's um, it's got kind of like this platform, um, you know, with a wheel here and a wheel on the other side. And coming out of the platform, you've got kind of a uh, pendulum, and you've got uh, you know some handles. Is this looking familiar to anybody here? Okay, so you'll see often like, you know, if like a wealthy donor comes to UT or something, they'll be uh, riding around on these things. Um, you may have wondered how it's able to stay upright, right? Uh, they seem to just be able to balance themselves automatically. Uh, it turns out that I'll be showing you exactly how that works. It's a pretty straightforward control problem. And we will be applying the technique of PID control uh, to essentially uh, design a Segway scooter in such a way that it can maintain its balance. Yes? Does it also have the, what's it called, the hoverboard? It's like a Segway thing, but it doesn't have the space. I mean, that's, that's too new for me. I'm old. Yeah. I was, yeah. <laughs> I was born in the 80s. Um, I have seen those things. I don't know. I don't know exactly how they work, although it may involve some sort of uh, active control. Okay. Okay. So, in the remaining time in class today, I'm going to take us through uh, modeling this system. Okay. We're going to create a dynamical model and we're going to model the system as an inverted pendulum. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a model of this system, a mechanical model. We have some base here. Uh, let's see, we have a pendulum coming out of the base. So this is kind of that, uh, that, that central pendulum coming out here. Um, the length of the pendulum we will call L. So note that this, uh, you know, let me, L is actually this length here. So the length of the pendulum we will call L. The mass per unit length we will call M bar. And the angle with the vertical we'll call theta. Okay, so theta is the angle going this way, counterclockwise. So let me just write these down. L is the length. M bar is the mass per unit length. Okay, such that L times M bar is equal to m the mass and theta is the angle uh with the vertical there okay so we can model this system similarly uh to how we've modeled other mechanical systems in the class how do you think we can model the the dynamics of this system what uh what law can we apply here sorry What law can we apply here? So we can apply essentially the angular form of Newton's second law. Okay, so we have that um, from angular momentum, we have that the time rate of change of angular momentum is equal to the sum of moments. So taking us back to physics 101, the sum of moments around, in this case, the base. Okay, so what we're gonna do is much like the structural system, we're gonna apply um, a balance of moments around the base. And we know that the time rate of change of angular momentum has to equal the sum of moments. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and do that and see what comes out of it. Okay, and I'm just gonna go by the time on that clock. Um, we have about so 10 or so minutes left, I think, yes. Okay, so let's go ahead and set up this problem. We have our inverted pendulum, which I will draw like this. Okay, we have, oh. Okay, we have that this here is our angle theta. Okay, and let's let's take a look at all the different um, moments for this pendulum. Okay, we have, first of all, we have that there's a motor in the base that exerts some torque, which I will just call T of T. Okay, so this is the torque applied by the motor. This is what we're going to be controlling. We're going to control a motor at the base of the Segway scooter. What other moments do we have for this inverted pendulum? What other moments do we have? The weight, exactly. So we have a force being applied um, due to gravity, which will be equal to m bar LG. Right, so m bar L is the mass of the pendulum. Uh, m, m bar LG is the force due to gravity. Okay, um, and if we want to convert this to a moment, we need to know this distance here, x. Sorry, I've got uh, two different things there. This this is x. Let me uh, let me clean this up a little bit. Okay, so we have this distance here is x. This angle here is theta. So we know that from trigonometry, sine of theta is equal to x over this hypotenuse here. So this hypotenuse will be L divided by two because we're at the center point. Okay, so we have sine of theta is equal to x divided by L divided by two which means that this distance x is equal to L over two times sine of theta. So therefore the moment due to gravity is equal to um, M bar LG exactly times L over two sine of theta. Okay, um, there's also another term that we need to express. Actually, first, let's also say that we have a force being applied perpendicularly to the top. Uh, so this will be a disturbance force, which I will call F of T. So this might be the disturbance of the rider, you know, uh, contacting the Segway scooter. Okay, so we'll say that the moment due to this disturbance is equal to the length of the rod times that disturbance force F of T. Okay, and the moment due to the motor, I'll just call T of T. Okay, so that's a torque that we're applying through our control action. Uh, for this theta here, let me also put this as theta T, just to be explicit here. And okay, so our, our angle is a function of time. Okay, and now from Newton's second law, uh, we have that the sum of moments, the sum of moments around the base is equal to the rate of change of angular momentum, which is equal to I, the moment of inertia, times the angular acceleration. Okay, so thinking back a bit all the way to physics, um, Physics 101 or statics, note that this I here is equal to for this rod, it'll be one third M bar times L uh, cubed. Okay, so this will be one third M bar L cubed times our angular 
acceleration. Okay, so let's let's add all these moments together and see what we get. I'll give you a second to write this down. Okay. So I think I stood up just enough time to finish deriving the dynamics. Okay, so we have that this term here, the rate of change of angular momentum is equal to the sum of moments. So let's add those moments up. Okay, so the rate of change of angular momentum is equal to one third m bar L cubed times theta double dot T. Okay, and that's going to be equal to, what are our different moments again? Sorry? Yeah, so uh, we have the torque at the base applied by the motor. So that's T of T plus L times F of T. So that's our disturbance plus the gravitational moment, which is, uh, let me write it on another line here. Okay, plus M bar L G times L over two sine theta T. Okay, and we can rewrite this, um, so that we have our inputs all on the right side. So let's just rewrite it in our standard form. One third M bar L cubed theta double dot T okay, minus M bar L G, uh, sorry, M bar L G times L over two sine theta T is equal to our torque T of T plus L times F of T. Okay, is this system linear or nonlinear? This is nonlinear. Where is the nonlinear term? <laughs> okay. uh, it's the sine term, right? Yeah. So we can't we can't solve this uh, explicitly. We'll need to make um, we'll need to linearize the system. Okay, we'll need to linearize. Luckily, it's not too difficult to do. So. Who remembers uh, what the Taylor expansion of sine of X is uh, around the origin? Yeah, so around the origin, sine of X is approximately equal to X. Okay, so what we can use is called the small angle approximation. Okay, and we can say that sine of theta t is approximately equal to theta t, as long as we do not deviate too much from the neutral position, okay? Thus, we have one third uh, m bar l cubed times theta double dot t minus one half m bar G L squared theta T is equal to T of T plus L times F of T. Okay, so this is the portion of the system. This is the endogenous portion corresponding to our internal dynamics. T of T is our control input and L F of T is our disturbance. So I believe we are out of time. On Thursday, we will continue to look at the system and we're specifically going to look at the use of PID control um, for stabilization and reference tracking so that we can get this Segway scooter to behave like a Segway scooter. Okay. Uh, and with that, I will end it. Uh, remember that I have office hours today at uh, 3.30 for you. Thank you.